Norm Stevenson. He came from Hull, which because of its geographical situation on the river, um, <coughs> had a very bad time with the Germans bombing it. And um, he's a bit like Jack Fletcher. He joined up when he was 17, and he was finished the war at 21. Um, they had different experiences because Jack, of course, was a Marine at Guadalcanal and Iwo Jima, whereas um, Don was in the RAF. And uh, it's about that period but when he was 17 to 21 that we came to get him up here today to talk about it. So I'd like to welcome Don Stevenson. When World War II was declared, I was 14. When I reached 17 and a quarter in 1942, I volunteered for air crew training to the RAF. This, the war became for me one of two phases. Uh, the first part was uh, uh, dominated by the aircraft of the Allies and also by the, very much by the Luftwaffe. Uh, on the one hand, and a little bit of the Japanese uh, towards the end. Uh, the second, if the second phase, when I, uh, from late 1942, when I joined the RAF, appears at first sight possibly to be more exciting, the first two and a half years should hold equal billing. Because my hometown, it was very fine as the most bombed city in Britain after London. Even in those first two and a half years, uh, under the Blitz, I believe it qualified the citizens as being in the front line. The city is the port of Hull, and there are good tactical reasons for the Germans that Hull became, after London, the main target of the Luftwaffe. The obvious reason was the city's importance, both as a major port and an industrial centre. But geographically, it is only a relatively short distance across the North Sea from the Luftwaffe's northern airfields in northern Germany, Holland and Scandinavia. Also, the city is only a little over 20 miles upriver along the broad river Humber situated on the northern bank where the smaller river Hull, uh, after which the city is named, uh, flows into it. The Humber goes to its length and it's approximately eight miles wide at the mouth. But the long narrow neck of land uh, is about four miles long across the mouth and ends at a point called Spurn Head, which was a, a flourishing port during the Viking settlements. This broad and easily recognisable estuary provided a good landfall for the Luftwaffe and by following the river westward they had a well marked route to other major centres such as Leeds, <coughs> Manchester, Liverpool and Sheffield. Hull itself was a, certainly a prime target. As a major port it was a vital transport centre. It had large and extensive docks at a seaward and vast fish docks upriver because in 1939 Hull was the largest fishing port in the world. It had large dry docks, shipbuilding and engineering yards. Besides merchant shipping, it was also a Royal Navy station. And alongside the docks were also two vast rail marshalling yards, one of which, stretching for some miles westward, was reputed to be the second largest in the world, second only to the marshalling yards in Hamburg. <coughs> uh, the one to the east, near the bigger docks, where it's completely gutted uh, by the Luftwaffe, when they dropped um, land uh, landmines on it. The other one, they seemed to miss it, but they completely destroyed our football field. <laughs> uh, it all started on the very first night of the war, in September 1939. Now, Hull became the first target in Britain, attacked by the Luftwaffe, and throughout the war, the city suffered 815 air raid alerts. From 1940, Hull was attacked repeatedly, and in 1941 became, became not only a nightly affair, but many times a night from dusk to dawn. This went right through 1942, and in three consecutive nights in May 1942, Hull suffered the full might of the Luftwaffe. Three full nights and days of what amounted to all-out warfare. <coughs> By the end of the war, almost 95% of Hull's housing had been either destroyed or badly damaged. Out of approximately 90,000 housing units, only about 6,000 were untouched. A typical night in Hull, particularly during 41 and 42, would be the air raid warning sirens sounding at dusk, and from then on it would be a procession during the night. First they all clear, 
followed quickly by another alert as each wave came in. There was often enemy aircraft making their way over Hulk Force to the inland targets. At its height, there were often five or six or more waves of bombers coming in. And of course, they came out the same way as they went in. And Hull received any packages that were, hadn't been delivered to the intended address. The hardship, especially on a snowy Yorkshire winter's night, of getting up out of a warm bed, led to people fitting out their air raid shelters with bunks. And during those blitz years, it became the normal bedding down procedures, straight to bed in the shelter. But it was still a tiring process because it was almost impossible to get a, a unbroken night's sleep. And there is no doubt that being under constant bombardment does, does cause stress. Everyone who lived through the Blitz had memories of the bombing raids, of the Russian roulette of the bombs, the anti-aircraft guns, the trumps of the bombs dropping, the explosions, and the fires. Police, soldiers, firemen, ambulances, rescue workers, and air raid warnings a never-ending noise, the chaos, and the danger with the resultant deaths and destruction. Many people on the outskirts of town and in the surrounding villages have vivid memories of daylight raids when even those working on the land could be machine gunned in the fields or in the local high street. Although by 1940 the citizens of Hull were well acquainted with enemy aerial warfare, it was maritime business that was still foremost in their minds, this is obvious from the position of this city. Uh, myself, before I joined um, the RAF, I worked for a shipbuilding company as an apprentice draftsman and spent quite a bit of time on both merchant vessels and ships of the Royal Navy. A number of my relatives and many friends and school classmates were at sea. <coughs> One cousin of mine who joined the Royal Navy at the beginning of the war was barely 18 at Dunkirk. What he experienced there caused him to have a nervous breakdown. He was invalided out of the Navy, but he recovered. He joined the RAF, became a Lancaster pilot, and won the DFC. Many of those classmates of mine who joined the Merchant Navy almost straight from school, which would have been the case in peacetime anyway, were in ships torpedoed by U-boats either in the North Sea or in the Atlantic Ocean. One of my friends was uh, in a ship sunk by the German battleship, the Graf Spee. In a way, he was lucky because the Graf Spee, where possible, picked up survivors. And then at sea, transferred them to her supply ship, the Altmark. The Altmark, being to some extent regarded as a merchantman, was able to make her way home to Germany down the Norwegian coast, seeking shelter from the Royal Navy or the RAF when necessary in the Norwegian fjords. At this early stage of the war, Norway was neutral and Britain recognised their neutrality, but under direct orders from Churchill, the British destroyer HMS Cossack entered the fjord, the crew boarded the Altmark and rescued the Allied seamen. Norway and Germany of course protested, but in Britain there was rejoicing when the 299 seamen were returned to England. Uh, my friend, by the way, had his 16th birthday aboard the Altmark, it would have been a long four or five years in a prison of war campaign. <coughs> when I became an air gunner in the RAF, all our training had been directed towards service in Fraser Nash, power operated turrets, the use of 303 Browning machine guns, and air gunnery, particularly air to air, all of which had, for the most part, the Luftwaffe in its sights. And as young air gunners, I think we all expected to be posted to a Lancaster operational training unit. For after all, Bomber Command was making use of crews that hadn't even finished OTU. This was in response, of course, to the ever-growing numbers raiding Germany. It was therefore something of a surprise to be sent back to sea, as it were, via a Catalina flying boat. But I soon learned, as all Catalina, Catalina crews did, to appreciate the qualities of the Catalina and the different lifestyle to that which we would have experienced on a bomber squadron. From Lochern in Northern Ireland, we were to experience a little of the North Atlantic flying before we were sent overseas to Southeast Asia Command. Lochern, by the way, was the base from which the Catalina that found the Bismarck crew. In Southeast Asia Command, our crew joined 191 Squadron and flew from Karangi Creek near Karachi, in what is now Pakistan, Riddles Lake near Madras, and finally from Kogelik at the southern tip of Ceylon. 
from Red Hills Lake, we flew shipping patrols, reconnaissance, air sea rescue, and the interception of Japanese shipping flying down the Burmese and Siamese coast. It was on one of these sorties that our hull got hold, which is not too good for a flying boat, but luckily we were able to repair the damage and land at base. From Karangi Creek we flew U-boat patrols. They were still operating in the Arabian Sea, the Persian Gulf, and the approaches to Karachi and Bombay. And we did one quite bizarre reconnaissance patrol flying to northern Pakistan over what is now a Taliban country. Finally, for 191 Squadron that is, we moved south to Ceylon and flew from Kogla, the RAF base, which was also used by the Qantas Catalina's on the double sunrise run. By this stage, the Japanese were beginning to be turned back, and a great deal of reconnaissance work was being done, with also much movement of VIPs. We did one fairly long trip to the Cocos Islands, approximately 16 and a half hours, Whilst there, moved out in the middle of the lagoon, the Japanese reconnaissance aircraft came over. But he did not seem particularly interested in us. We learned later that he was more interested in the airstrip being prepared for liberators. Without knowing it at the time, this foreshadowed the demise of the RAF use of Catalinas in that area of Southeast Asia. The last trip we did on our Catalina was a journey of six days. Three days out of Kogla, three days back. Day one, due south from Kogla to the tiny atoll of Diego Garcia. Day two, west to the islands of the Seychelles. And day three, further west to Mombasa in East Africa. All this flying, of course, was over ocean. And the first two and a half days was in balmy tropical conditions for which we were appropriately dressed. But a few hundred miles out from the African coast, we had extreme monsoon weather, which was not supposed to be uh, that back quite so early in the season. Besides monsoonal rain, we became enveloped in extremely black clouds and it turned very, very cold. Visibility was extremely murky to say the least. Mombasa is situated upon a bay which is surrounded by low hills. It was night before we sighted Mombasa and circling the bay we could make out a mast light on many merchant ships anchored there. The lights didn't look very inviting and the sea was black and extremely rough. Not ideal conditions for a flying boat landing, but somewhere down there in the dark amidst the shipping was our landing strip. After some searching we finally landed in heavy weather with a bounce and a bang. And as someone once remarked, a Catalina belly flop should always be accompanied with a prayer. As the front gunner it was my job to then dismantle the top of the turret, climb out and perch on the thin strip of catwalk that ran around the side of the nose. The catwalk was approximately two feet or so above the water, but on this dark, cold and stormy night, dressed in <laughs> thin tropical clothing, drenched by monsoonal rain, continually soaked by the choppy waves and feeling the effects of the cold, what was normally a quite joyful and satisfying exercise became somewhat of a nightmare. Mm -hmm as the cat was plunging at times almost nose down. My feet were under water and felt as if they were freezing. It was very difficult searching for our mooring boy amidst those great hulking merchant ships. But obviously found it we did and after a day's rest in Mombasa we picked up our VIPs, the weather took a turn for the better and we did our three day trip back to Kogla, delivered our passengers, presumably on their way to Mountbatten's headquarters. We then travelled as passengers ourselves in the Sunderland up to the Heli Conversion Unit in India and after two or three weeks training we were sent on our way to Jisor, an RAF station in East Bengal near the Burmese border to join 358 Liberator Squadron and so I was to complete my operational flying courtesy of the Consolidated Aircraft Company. Lord Louis Mountbatten was intent on building up the Liberator Squadron on the Burma front as the Allied 1944-45 winter offensive pushed the Japanese south out of Burma. He was also to make the directive that we were to let nothing stop us in the air or on the ground. And this included flying through the monsoon uh, with its atrocious weather conditions and eventual catastrophic losses in both aircraft and crews. Hence the transfer of Catalina crews to the Liberator Squadron. From 191 Squadron, we and another one other crew were sent to 358 Squadron. 
This squadron, 358, was formed as a heavy bomber squadron, but after a very short period, it was put onto special duties, which involved transporting secret agents and supplies into drop zones behind enemy lines located in Burma, Malaya, Siam, French Indochina, and the Dutch East Indies. There were three main hazards to this. The first was the long distances behind enemy lines, mostly over jungle, and the still strong presence of Japanese fighters. And last, but by no means least, the monsoon and the virtually ever-present low cloud cover. Although this constant cloud cover gave us some good protection against the Japanese fighters, takeoff was mostly in the afternoon, and most of the missions were also solo, unescorted sorties, and they were under cover of night over enemy territory. But in the end months of the war, uh, more daylight missions were undertaken. A sortie over Burma would be eight or nine hours, but this would be regarded as a short trip. The, Re the Liberator was built, like the Catalina, for longer missions, sometimes up to 24 hours, although an average trip would be about 15 hours. 358 Squadron had been reformed in late 1944 and started out with seven Liberators short of squadron strength. Because the war was at its height in Europe, replacing lost aircraft and lost crews was slow and difficult. In the early days of the squadron, ten moon days were concentrated on, five days before the full moon and five days after. Considering the slow arrival of replacement crews and planes, the crews in those early days were flying almost every night during those ten nights, and losses averaged five planes, five planes and crews each moon period. On the very first night the squadron operated, it lost six out of ten aircraft put in the air. A lot of air crew, considering that there were ten men to a Liberator crew, with often three or four agents to drop, and one or two uh, so-called dispatches, so spare air guns, probably. I can't find a final figure showing 358 squadron losses, but counting back, based on what I experienced and heard, I think it must have been at least 48 aircraft and crews for the first eight months of the squadron's operations, and possibly about an equal number for the last two or three months of the war. One of these losses which hit us hard was our sister, our brother, ex Catalina crew. I know that just prior to the end of the war, you could walk into the sergeant's mess and have a real job finding someone you actually knew. It is always dramatic when an aircraft and its crew are lost, but when the crew lives to fight another day, there is a story to tell. Probably one of the most outstanding missions and amazing outcomes performed by 358 Squadron was by Flying Officer Harry Smith and his crew in the Liberator P for Peter. They were to drop 14 containers and four special agents into Siam. This particular mission was to take off at midnight to reach the drop zone at dawn. This meant that the return trip would be in broad daylight from 600 miles behind the Japanese lines with very little <laughs> protective armament. The distinctive type and weight of the payloads on these special duty missions meant that the aircraft had been stripped of the front turret, the ball gun turret, and the two beam guns, leaving only the mid-upper and the tail. <coughs> Thank goodness for continuing cloud cover. This was to be Pete for Peter's crew's last mission of their tour. But Harry Smith, thinking of the long 15-hour trip and back, he was too keyed up to rest, so he said that he he finished reading a Mickey Spillane novel called You Only Die Once. And after dinner, the crew sat through the station movie For Whom the Bell Stills. <laughs> At 06.30, uh, Peter Peter began a descent to reach the drop zone. This was when things started to go wrong. <clears throat> the sun was rising earlier than expected, and for the first time in over 18 months, the sky was completely clear, with visibility unlimited. No hiding place today. It was then that enemy fighters were sighted at two o'clock. Nine Oscar type fighter planes attacked. Three head on, <coughs> three from starboard, and three from both below and above. Uh, I must say that they reported nine <coughs> Japanese uh, records after the war. They said it was 10. I don't think it would have made much difference really. Harry Smith said that mostly they stayed away from the tail turret. Um, we must have been making a bit of a name for ourselves probably. Um, the navigator was killed in almost the first attack, for as Harry says, 
Although he was taking violent evasive action, the frontal attacks were devastating. Only minutes later, Bob Poole, the co-pilot, was mortally hit in the chest. At the same time, the mid-upper was, uh, villa was hit. Harry's description was that they were being systematically shot to pieces. The flight deck was in a shambles, cannon shells and bullets slamming about everywhere. The starboard elevator, radios, engine controls, instruments, and what was left of the engines <coughs> were destroyed. They were now two loaded parachutes, and Harry gave the crash landing order. As he remembers, there was a colossal rendering of metal as the plane crashed through the trees. The wings, with their load of fuel, sheared off right away. Harry thought good riddance. What was left after what had been the bomb bay was in flames and the remaining ammunition was exploding in all directions. One of the agents had a gaping hole in his stomach, another had a broken collarbone, and a third had a fractured back. Four more of the Liberator crew had died as the enemy aircraft continued to strafe the crash site. Nine people had survived, but their position was critical as there were some 300,000 Japanese troops to the north of them on the run from Burma. Harry Smith himself had lost a lot of blood from head wound and had to rest a while against a tree while supporting the agents who had a stomach wound. He died as Harry held him. Just then, Curly Copley, the rear gunner, struggled out of the wreckage of the tail section and together they pulled out the remaining survivors. Harry said he was trying not to think of the consequences if they were picked up by Japanese soldiers because the treatment of captured aircrew was brutal and final. Quite recently, a crew from 159 Squadron, which crashed in Burma, was tortured and then beheaded, which I believe was quite the thing for their crew. They opened the last of their K-rations. The K-rations were the American ration supply, and uh, the packers often put messages inside the, the ration boxes, and this message read, Jolly good luck to you wherever you are. From Dromedary Food, Chicago, Illinois, USA. <laughs> we all flew uh, wearing our Smith & Wesson revolvers on these special duty sorties, but it probably wouldn't have helped the crew of Peter Peter had they encountered some of the 300,000 Japanese troops moving towards them, or the 15,000 garrisoned at Bangkok. They were, however, picked up by villagers and then hit by the Thai police. They traveled for two or three days by bullock cart and riverboat. Eventually they arrived in Bangkok and were somehow smuggled through the 15,000 Japanese soldiers. Allied secret agents took them to their headquarters, located in all places in the palace of the regent of Siam. Here, two uh, Thai doctors operated on their injuries. There was a severe lack of medical equipment and Harry Smith's head wound was stitched together using a shoemaker's needle and a pair of pliers. They now had to face the difficulties of moving on. And so at midnight the next day, they were piled into a battered old bus. After more adventures, uh, too many to recount here, they reached a rendezvous site and DC-3 from base flew them back to India. Harry Smith said that it was difficult to believe that the entire episode had taken only three weeks. At the time, they, uh, they knew that they were the only liberator to crash behind enemy lines and make it back. And I think it was probably, that was probably held true for the whole war there. Uh, the war came to an end. Um, this is a photograph of uh, myself on the right of it. I'm 20 actually there. Uh, the young man next to me is a year older, but I went to school with him and he was on Lancaster's and he, uh, he won the DFM, uh, the Lancaster had one pilot and the flight engineer sat next to him. Uh, on the way back from Germany, they'd been beaten up a bit, uh, the pilot was killed and um, my friend here, he was the only the flight engineer but he flew the Lancaster back and landed it safely. Um, there's a lot of stories to tell about that in the meeting. Uh, as I said, the war came to an end and my young age told against me under the age and service release scheme. The squadron was split up and sent to different RAF stations in India and Burma. I was working in a signals office in Calcutta when I and two others were sent to Lahore, a four-day rail journey uh, across northern India. It was a slow journey in a train, a wooden train with wooden seats. It stopped, I think, at just about every station. Our intention was to buy a bottle of beer at every stop, but we found out that alcoholic beverages couldn't be bought unless purchased with a meal. 
Luckily, a fried egg and a bread roll counted as a meal, so we were able to make this rather uncomfortable journey with a sufficient supply of beer and an overabundance of fried egg rolls. The journey thus passed pleasantly enough, and I stepped off the train in Lahore, and a few days later celebrated my 21st birthday.